disabilities. Baroness, Baroness Buscombe's speech, I thought, raised so many of the challenges that people face online, and I'm sure that the masses who are watching Parliament live as we speak, even if they're not in here, will really recognise what she was talking about. Um, the particular example of some of the animal rights activists, certainly they can indeed be a scourge, but I wouldn't want to confine it to them, because I think that trashing reputations online, false allegations, um, have become a, a, a kind of activist chosen weapon these days. And in fact, one of the ways that I uh, describe cancel culture as distinct from no platforming is that it takes the form of some very terrible things being said about people online, a lot of trolling, things going viral, and um, also using the online world to lobby employers to get people sacked and so on. So it's a, it's a familiar story and it can be incredibly unpleasant. So she has every sympathy and the people she was describing have my sympathy, but I do disagree with her remedy. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is that a lot of those trends actually are not done by people who are anonymous. I mean, it is striking that there's um, a huge number of people with large accounts, well-known public figures, sometimes with hundreds of thousands of followers, sometimes more than a million, who are prepared to do exactly what I've just said in plain sight, often to me. Now, I've thought long and hard about this because I really wanted to use this opportunity to read out a list and name and shame them. But I've decided that um, when they go low, I'll try and at least go a little higher. But I do think that the whole kind of subtweeting, twitch hunts are an issue. And I think it's one of the reasons why people think we need an online harms bill. And I, as I say, I have every sympathy. And I do know that there is sometimes it can feel as though if people are anonymous, that they'll say things that they wouldn't say to your face or if you knew who they were but I think it's more that, that the distance of being online even when you know who they are they'll say it to you online or about you online and then when you see them at the drinks reception they scuttle away <laughs> my main objection though to Baroness Buscombe's amendment in general and the whole question of anonymity is it, it treats anonymity as though it itself is inherently an unsafe thing to do um, I also think there's a worry, more, more broadly on verification, about creating two tiers of users, those who are willing to be verified and those who are not, and those who are not somehow having a cloud of suspicion upon them. Um, I think there's a danger that undermining online anonymity in the UK could set a terrible precedent likely to be emulated by authoritarian governments and other jurisdictions, and it's something we have to bear in mind. Just on, on the kind of evidence, I was interested in, in um, Big Brother Watch's report, and they were reporting on, on some work, um, analysis by New Statesman uh, magazine, which, shed, which showed that there's little evidence to suggest that anonymity itself makes online discourse more febrile. Um, in... Uh, they, they, they did an assessment of, involving tweets sent to uh, parliamentarians since January 2021, and so there was a little discernible difference in the nature or tone of the tweets that MPs received from anonymous or non-anonymous accounts. While 32% of tweets from anonymous accounts uh, were classed as angry, according to the metric uh, used by New Statesman, so too were 30% of tweets from accounts with full names attached. Similarly, 5.6% of tweets from anonymous accounts included swear words only slightly higher than the figure of 5.3% for named accounts. So they went through these various metrics, but the point was they said slightly higher, not much of a difference. So I think that that's to be borne in mind. Actually, the evidence isn't there. The other issue is, and I, and I don't, in this whole debate, I've wanted to emphasise freedom as, uh, as at least equal, if not a greater value, than the safetyism of this bill. But in this instance, I will say 
that actually, as the noble Baroness, Baroness Bull indicated, anonymity is actually, um, for some people, an important safety mechanism. It's a tool in the armoury of those who want to um, fight the powerful, and, and they are not, you know, and, and it can be anyone, young people who are experimenting with their sexuality, not out, it gives them a freedom to explore that. It can be, as, as was mentioned, survivors of, uh, of uh, sexual violence and domestic abuse. Um, it's certainly crucial to the work of journalists, civil liberties activists and whistleblowers in the UK and around the world. You know, many of the Iranian women's accounts are anonymous. They're using, you know, they're not using their correct names. And the same with Hong Kong activists, but we could, we could go on. I think anyway, just in terms of our concerns with this bill, that compulsory um, identity verification does mean being forced to share personal data, and so there is a privacy issue for everyone, not just kind of the heroic uh, 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 civil liberties uh, people. But in a way, it's your own business why you're anonymous. That's the point I'm trying to make. There's so many toxic issues at the moment. There are a lot of people who just can't come out. And I know that I often mention the gender critical issue, but it is true that in many professions you cannot give your real name or you will be not just socially ostracised but potentially jeopardise your career. And I know I wrote an article during the 2016-2017 days called the, uh, the Secret Brexiteers and that was also true that many teachers I knew who voted to leave and professors actually had to be anonymous online or they wouldn't have survived the call. The final thing is that I don't think that online anonymity or pseudo-anonymity is a barrier to tracking down and prosecuting those who commit the kind of criminal activity on the internet as described, or, you know, some of the, the, uh, uh, the issues that we're facing. The police report, uh, report shows that in 2017 to 18, 96% of attempts by public authorities to identify anonymous users of social media accounts, their email addresses and telephone, resulted in successful identification of the suspect in the, investi in the investigation. In other words, the police already have a range of intrusive powers to track down individual, individuals should there be a criminal problem. And the Investigative Powers Act in 2016 allows the police to acquire communications data, for example, email addresses, the location of a device from which alleged illegal uh, um, anonymous activity is conducted and use this data as evidence in court. If it's not illegal and it's just unpleasant, then I'm afraid that's the world we live in. And I would argue that what we require in such febrile uh, uh, times such as this is not bans or setting the police on people, but is actually to set the example of civil discourse and to have more speech and show that free speech is actually a way of conducting society, uh, uh, conducting disagreement and argument without trashing reputation.